everybody. It's Dana Martin, community producer for Anarchapulco. And I'm here tonight with Larkin Rose and Amanda Rockwitz. Hey, guys. Hi. So um, I'd love for you guys to just tell our viewers who you are, for those of you that don't know. I mean, most people know who you guys are, but I mean, half the people attending have never possibly heard of you, and, and believe it or not, and they're going to learn a lot about you during this event because you guys are like one of the biggest rock stars coming. I mean... Seriously, oh, like uh -oh. people, people ask all the time about, about you guys and if you're going to be there and they, they can't wait to meet you in person. So I'd love for you guys to share if you could start, Larkin, who you are and what got you started on this path to uh, anarchy. Well, I'm just sort of a loud mouth who likes to argue stuff. And that was true back when I was conservative, constitutionalist, libertarian leaning, whatever. Um, and along the way, liking to argue about stuff and liking to win arguments, um, I would notice that I wasn't consistent in my own belief system. Um, and I would go back and modify it and tweak it and whittle it down and eventually realize that when I had finally described the ultimate ideal moral legitimate government, it wasn't government anymore. Um, and so I accidentally noticed, wait, that kind of makes me an anarchist. Um, and that was 22 years ago now. Um, since then I've been writing things and articles and doing videos and, and books like The Most Dangerous Superstition is probably the one I'm most known for. I also have a novel called The Iron Web. I've done, I don't know how many hundreds of, of YouTube videos and, and things like that. Um, because basically, and, and my mission now is the same it's been for the last 22 years, which is try to help other people go through the process I went through, but not so slowly and stupidly and awkwardly as I went through it. Cause it took me years to give up what now is just an obvious contradiction to me. And I think, why would it take me so long to go through that? So now I just try to help nudge other people through the process faster. Um, and I'm happy to say that a lot of people have said I helped them get there a lot faster. And I'm still slightly embarrassed by how long it took me when, most of the anarchists I know got there a lot faster than I did. But so that's pretty much everything I do now revolves around trying to help other people escape the, the cult of, of authoritarianism. Wow. You know, you know, I'm, I'm noticing as I'm listening to you, I'm going through my own journey of, of learning to be more authentic and honest. And I'm reading this awesome book called Radical Honesty. And this has just clicked for me. I think, I mean, you are so beloved. You have such an amazing following. You're so real. You're so honest about your journey. And that's, I think that's pretty rare. I really do. And, and hearing you just be like vulnerable and sharing your truth of how you didn't know what you were doing and you want to help other people get there better. I mean, most people would come off like they've been experts since they came out of the womb, but you're like so willing to share your mistakes, how you got there. Um, I, that just really, really personally in, inspires me a lot. So thank you for, for sharing that. Yeah, well, well, thanks. And it's, to me, it's funny because I really, and I describe it this way, and I'm not exaggerating, and it's not false modesty. I feel like my job is now to state the bleeding obvious in a way that any idiot can understand it. Like, it doesn't <laughs> feel like I'm just such a genius, you have to listen. Like, it really sounds like I'm, you know, it feels like I'm stating something that's so stupidly obvious, everyone should know it automatically. And the thing is, most people would if they weren't, you know, sent through the years and years of indoctrination to to not see the bleeding obvious um so the whole the whole thing of like you should look up to me and follow me just seems ridiculous because i'm stating something that's just stupidly obvious it just i may have gotten there earlier than some other people and i'm just sort of saying hey this is stupidly obvious look at this until you realize it's stupidly obvious so the whole like i don't like the whole like look up to me, I'm your guru. It's just, no, I'm, I'm looking forward to the day when everybody will understand the bleeding obvious and I can go to other stuff instead yeah. of this. Yeah, that's awesome. That's really, really wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Amanda, so tell me your journey. So how did you get to be doing what you're doing? And you're, I mean, you guys are like the anarchist like dream team, the two of you as a couple. Um, well, <laughs> I want to hear, I, I want to hear the story. Can you guys share or will you share, Amanda? Yeah. Cool. Absolutely. Um, so I, um, I crashed into him on my own journey that was much later. I'm a, by comparison, 22 years he's been, you know, on that, on this path. And I'm like, I sort of became an anarchist and I became a fan of like 
Ron Paul and then I became an anarchist very recently. So like I was an anarchist as of probably 2012. And that started from me being your typical um, bubble first world American who grew up in the West and sort of didn't like anything to do with politics, didn't think about much and was sort of a default conservative, but because my family was um, and sort of, I guess I could describe myself as, you know, in a lot of ways, very packaged in a perfect little programmed piece of human being that came out of the school system, like a cookie cutter and not really developed and not really didn't really know who I was or anything. And I think for me, just discovering how to like figuring out how to get rid of this lie in my head of like, there has to be somebody forcefully ruling over me or man, or there has to be somebody in charge of all of us and getting rid of that big lie and really seeing what human freedom was just started to work at my entire psyche and my brain. And it was really an emotional and mental healing process that has taken years that changed the way I saw the world reality. It, you know, it made me want to rewild and go back into nature and it's changed how I saw economy and it gave me confidence because it reshaped the way I saw things from a truth perspective for me. This makes sense now. And it didn't before perspective. And that happened through the Ron Paul and through discovering just people, freedom lovers on the internet and reading their stuff and their content, being one of those quiet lurkers who didn't say anything. And I found him after I became an anarchist in 2012. So in 2012, I watched a video that all of you, well, many people who are watching this will know of, and it's called The Philosophy of Liberty. And on YouTube, that video got me to the philosophy of, okay, there's no interaction where the initiation of force is justified. That's not okay. Um, and so that got me there mentally. And then I found this guy, and I was looking for my words and my voice. And this guy was like, he was so clear cut on his words and his voice that it, it struck me. And I was just a friend of his trying to help him out. And then we ended up bringing our love lives together just organically that happened. Like we didn't plan it. It's just, we both ended up together. And then our vision of the future and what we saw important sort of matched. And I just wanted to basically support him and match my dreams with his. And that sort of happened without us trying. <laughs> it just became this. And here we are like four years later since like it's been a little over four years since we met and, and now we've, and, and candles in the dark is something that we started because um, we wanted to really help other people in the community figure out how to communicate in the best, clearest way and figure out how to get through to people rather than fighting and arguing and bashing their heads all the time. Yeah. So that's how candles in the dark came about. Yeah. I was just going to ask you about that. So candles in the dark, you know, this is, um, People started asking for it by name at the beginning of our event when we were planning. Is Candles in the Dark going to be there? And um, so that's when it really gave me a huge sense of what a powerful thing it is that you guys are doing. Now, now you've taken Candles in the Dark on the road, right? You guys have been touring with it. Can you tell me a little bit yeah. about that experience? Yeah, we've done a number of different cities. Uh, if I tried to count them, I'd miscount. <laughs> but, we, but, we've done six U.S. cities. Okay. I'll believe your count. Um, but the fun part is, first of all, a, a super short encapsulation of what it is. It's not at all what I do in public. When I debate in public, no. it's just, you know, debate, combat, ideas smashing into each other. This is the exact opposite. This is basically, if, if there's somebody in your life who's still full statist, you know, wherever on the, the spectrum of, of statism, how do you talk to them without it turning into an argument, without them freaking out? And I accidentally learned over the last couple of decades that there are ways to get around the, the psychological minefield of somebody's belief system. Usually, as soon as they feel like you're different than me, your beliefs are different, they get on the defensive and it turns into an argument and people are screaming at each other. And I found there really is a way to tiptoe through that and talk to the person and hear them and have them hear you. Um, but it takes a lot of self-training because what we naturally do, what I naturally do, and what almost everybody naturally does naturally turns into an argument when you're going after something that's, you know, somebody's basic paradigm, their basic view of reality, and you're saying, yeah, you're, you're totally wrong about how you see the whole world, people don't respond well to that. So, so it was about finding the ways to, to, to talk to people where you're, it, you're really just bringing out of them their inner anarchist, because Pretty much everybody already has an inner anarchist and there's a way to bring it out without you having to beat them over the head um, with your own belief system, which 
I do plenty of that too <laughs> in debates, mm -hmm. but this is the uh, candles in the dark is the opposite of that of how do you actually communicate in a way that they hear the message. And the funnest part of the candles in the dark events is that everyone ends by inviting in a few statists. We don't call them that because it sounds like an insult, sort of is an insult. Um, but inviting the participants to bring in somebody they know who still believes in it to have exchanges back and forth to try the methods they've, they've used. And it never ends in arguments and screaming and defensiveness. It always ends in like conversations that are useful where both sides have heard it. Um, if anybody wants a, a really fun example, um, it's the last year's Anarchapulco. I had the pleasure of doing that for the, um, the manager of the Princess Hotel. He and, tried out the methods in Candles in the Dark in, oh. on the second day of the seminar as an example on the hotel manager in front of the entire Candles in the Dark attendees. Yeah, wow, because, I did not know that. That's awesome. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and you can find them on YouTube. If you look for Anarchapulco Candles in the Dark, um, I think that's all you need. Because, um, yeah, like in the middle of the thing that organizer that year, Nathan came up and said, do you want to uh, do this on the, the manager of the Princess Hotel? I said, yeah, do I get to do it? <laughs> So, but that, that's a fun uh, online version that people can look at. And it's perfectly calm, happy. People are all, you know, relaxed and, and joking with each other and, and having a thoughtful discussion. And, you know, how many, what percentage of normal conversations between anarchists and statists end up like that? It's like almost none unless you go out of your way to control how you come across and what you're saying and what you're asking. But it can be done. And as we demonstrate at the end of every one of these things by bringing in people and showing, here's what your conversations could look like with statists if you use these particular methods. I think it's worth um, pointing out that at two of the events, we did one in Denver. And then we, our most recent, our last one we just did was in October. And we did it in Tampa, Florida. And um, at both of those events, um, we didn't quite, we normally have like four, you know, outsider status to haven't to people who haven't thought about this or who lean left or right politically or whatever come in we'd only had like two or three and we wanted to try to have another person and so we ran out of people nobody had anybody to bring so we had like a person do it and another person do it and then we thought well why don't we try to get another person a stranger maybe and so in Denver, we, um, one of the girls at one of the attendees of Candles in the Dark ran out on the streets of Denver and found the best dressed homeless man I've ever seen and just brought him in. And he didn't even, the poor guy didn't even know what he was getting into. We were just like, we would like 15 minutes of your time. There's no pressure here. We're going to ask you a few questions about what you believe for 15 minutes and we'll give you 50 bucks cash. Cause that's what we do at every candle in the dark. So he was like 50 bucks for how long? What? Yeah. Okay. Sure. I don't know what I'm getting into, but it can't be bad. And he thought it was interesting and he was fine by the end of it. Well, in Florida, we did the same thing. Somebody went out and found, we we're at an actual like a wildlife, park, a like state park. a state park a in Florida. And so we had like the boardwalk going through this swamp and somebody ran off down the boardwalk, found some father who was there with his family, brought him over and decided to ask him these questions. And as, as we're putting him through the questions, it turns out he happened to be like, a libertarian leaning to anarchists already, like a random stranger. None of us knew. <laughs> oh, wow. To do that by default, like we didn't even know. And he was like former U S Marine. And he was just like, he was worried he was offending us because he didn't know who we were. So he was sitting there answering questions like, well, you know, I don't know what you guys believe, but just saying, I really think the government doesn't have any right to be in any of our lives. <laughs> That's doing awesome. anything. So <laughs> we're all sitting there like, <laughs> <laughs> You're wow. fine, dude. It's okay. So we did this with strangers, and even with strangers, there was never any, there was not tension. It wasn't combative. Like, their guards were up when they came in, and then they dropped in, you know, a matter of seconds because they realized nobody here is, you know, your energy is everything. And candles in the dark is, um, it's for anarchists who are ready to communicate the message. And the message is what matters to them, not being right. And if you're ready to communicate the message in a way that works, Candles in the Dark is about looking at you because you have to look at yourself and go, what what am I doing and, and am I, how am I approaching this conversation? Am I going into it like, this is me versus you. This is my, I'm an anarchist and I know better and I'm going to beat you over the head until you admit I'm right. And if right. you think the goal of success and you're going to convert people that way, you're going to have like a 0% conversion rate. Yeah, yeah. Well, I love that you guys are doing this because it's really like embodying the philosophy and showing people how, how to live it in a new way. I mean, when I educate mm -hmm. parents about... Um, 
yeah. a partnership paradigm instead of authoritarian. I mean, it's so, so important, these tools. So, you know, I'm sure you're helping people not only be able to debate, not debate, but discuss these uh, principles, but also with everything in their life, like how to discuss uh, peacefully, how to have, have these communication skills that are so important uh, if we're going to go, you know, live what we're preaching. So I, I, I think that's really awesome. What are some of your success stories? Have people come back and like told you that it changed their lives or that it's really helped them? Do you guys have success stories? Yeah. We, Every time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We get awesome. lots of stories. We have lots of fun stories and we usually tell some during the thing. Well, we can tell about, was, was that the first one we did where, uh, military veteran comes in. I that know, was the first one. Yeah, the first the one first we ever did. In um, Phoenix. And one of the one of the attendees invited in somebody he knows, a friend of his or co-worker. I don't even know what it was. Um, but guy who's probably 50s or something and had been in the military for ages. You could tell he's like staunch conservative. You could tell he thought he was coming into a debate, and which is fine. So he's all there. And, and, and I won't like give all the details back and forth, but basically we get into this conversation and it's just asking him, well, what do you think about this? And then asking the questions in the right way. Cause it's really just, it's just bringing out of them what they believe and gently introducing them to the, the conflicts in their own belief system without being judgmental and saying, this is a, you know, this is a contradiction. Um, and so in, in the span of 15 minutes, first of all, when the 15 minutes is up, it's like, boop, like she's the timekeeper. It's like, time's up. Here's yep. your money. You're done. Yeah, you Never do mind it. what you're in the middle of. And his response was immediately, no, no, keep going. This is fun. <laughs> like he wanted to keep going. And th this is from someone who, who started, you know, obviously on the defensive expecting a fight. And very quickly, not only was he relaxed because he realized, wow, nobody's attacking me. But very quickly, he was laughing with the person he was talking to. And just and it suddenly occurred to me, because this was the first one we had done, it, that is one of the most important indications. If somebody can laugh with you, they don't think they're fighting you. Right. And they're not, you know, that's a very different way to view a discussion. If somebody's chuckling with you, even if it's a disagreement, it means they're relaxed and they're open and they're hearing you and you're hearing them. In almost every single one since then, the person we invite in pretty quickly is relaxed and laughing with the other person. And I would ask, you know, the average anarchist, how often do you get that result where the person is just like all friendly and chuckling along with you instead of, no, you're, what you believe is going to be the end of the world. And so to, to jump to the punchline, um, the person who invited him told me that that night, the guy sent him an email that said, I have some questions, but I think I'm turning into an anarchist. <laughs> and this is a so great. military veteran who was very, you know, staunch in his ways. Here's the conservative thing I believe in. I'm pretty sure the guy that brought him, they had been friends. And I'm pretty sure they, yeah. if he was one of those ones that is even a more difficult example, because somebody will bring this person in and go, I've got a conversational rut with this person. I've yeah. been having you know, tips with this person, or we've we're been talking politics arguing. and we, yeah. you know, butt heads and he already knows where I stand and he knows how my talking points. And so he came in combative because he's like my friend who argues with me and he's thinking, you know, invited me to this thing. What am I in for? And it was relaxed. And by the end of it, he was an anarchist, you know, so a day or few two later, <laughs> yeah, like saying so he's an anarchist. Literally years of them arguing didn't accomplish what 15 minutes, minutes of day. using a method that the guy had just learned that day and the day before did more than it, he had done in years. Like, and that's the actual difference of when you understand the psychology and how to not set off the other person's defenses, um, there is that big a difference. So that was one of our funnest stories. And it was, especially because it was like the first one we did. Was like, um, oh, that was awesome. <laughs> there was the guy who brought his girlfriend who was a statist and there was, um, he wanted to bring her in on the second day as somebody we tried out on, except that the candles in the dark he came to was the one we did in Washington. It was kind of out there in the woods. It was middle of nowhere at somebody's house who offered to hold it. And he's like, there's really nowhere for my girlfriend to go and wait for a two day seminar they while I'm here. She's got to be, she's got to be in this house with me staying here. Um, or, you know, by the, and so like she was going to be with him and we're like, well, it might be awkward because we're kind of talking about her. And because I guess she was a, like a left leaning liberal at the time. And he's like, oh, I think it'll be fine. I want to bring her. And we're like, well, if you think she, she'll be fine with it, just bring her. And why happens. not? See what happens. Right. So end of day two, she had had, she had not knowing anything about anarchism, had seen 
you know, anarchists talking to other anarchists, got, seen this whole seminar happen. And at the end of day two, Larkin said, do you want to be the, you know, do you want me to, to do this back and forth with you? You want to be the one that gets the questions asked? You can sit and be the statist for, you know, at the end. And she's like, well, I guess I could, but I'm not a statist anymore. So. Oh, that's, oh my gosh. That's so great. <laughs> wow. So how did you, how did you guys learn? How did you guys learn this? Did you guys develop this together? I mean, you know, I have to say that hearing you guys talk about this together is really amazing. Like, it seems like your love and your connection is kind of was the formation of all of this. Is this something you created together? Yeah. No, she, she, it was actually at one of the Anarchofolkos where she started thinking of, um, like, we should be doing some sort of seminar thing. And then it was a very vague idea. And I said, I'm not, I don't want to do anything unless I'm all the way, like, I think it's awesome and I'm totally proud of it. And right now it's not clear enough in my head. Do you remember how I got the idea though? Remember where it came from? Why, why I said this should be a seminar as in the method oh, yeah. of teaching people how to communicate where we got the idea from because we had just, we basically did a very, like a 40 minute impromptu version of the same thing because they asked, Hey, do you want to suddenly do one over here and did it with, in a room of a few people and it worked really dang well without with hardly any planning. I made it up like while at the event and it went so well that we were like, we should probably like, make this into a thing. So because he's, he was, he's been doing little side, like Larkin Rose side seminars with Anarchopoco since he first went in 2016 and Shepard Humphreys graciously put together his uh, talk called the psychology of statism that year, the, um, the Anarchopoco that we went to where you did that. And, and that was a uh, 20, 17 and yeah. 2017 and he did the psychology of statism and what happened was at the end of his two-hour talk the psychology of statism he explained how he figured out very clearly how that mental contradiction looks in a statist head and and how you can see it and visualize it and therefore kind of navigate that and make sense of how people end up with this contradiction in their heads and how we get indoctrinated and how that really how you can undo that lie and at the end of the talk, he was allowed to do a question and answer discussion on the audience. And about three or four dozen people at least were there, if not maybe five dozen people were there. And they had all paid impromptu like 20 bucks or so at the door or something to just come in and hear the talk. And so when question and answer time came, people were really into it. And it gave Larkin a chance to delve into some people having questions that you could tell were on the fence. They weren't, and not everyone in the room was an anarchist since the other others of us were realizing this. So what developed from that was this really productive discussion where new people you could see were having epiphanies and other people in the audience were like taking the mic and asking Larkin different other questions. And then he was, you know, asking them questions back and getting them to think. And that was when we were in the, then right after that all happened, we get in a car, like a little, you know, crappy taxi in Mexico to go do something. And we get in the car and like, we're in the backseat of the car. And I was like, this, that, 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 what we just had happened there, that fruitful thing that happened where people learned and they got somewhere and we brought people new to this over and they started to see it. I'm like, there needs to be a way we can help people figure out how to make this happen everywhere and make it keep happening. This is it. This is how we spread the message. How can we, how can you put something together or we put something together that is like packaged that either, either we do it and it pays well or it pays us something to make it happen. Usually we lose or we break even. But <laughs> it either it was anything to make it possible. If it could just be possible, like charge just enough to make it possible and then help people have keep having these, what would that look like? And then this genius here took his 22 years of conversational practice and managed to condense it into the exact right questions and a sort of actual approach that is – you can put it together in a seminar and it makes sense and it works every time. Wow. Are you guys going to continue doing this? Are you going to tour like next year? And Actually, our plan was at least the present plan is we are doing two down in Acapulco, one right before and one right after in Acapulco. Um, and after that, that was going to be it just because we usually lose money. We don't have any money enough to lose. Um, but I, we also wanted to make a, basically a virtual like a, a package thing that anybody can do from anywhere um, and I haven't quite figured out exactly how to do that because there's there's part of it that's sort of hard to put into that format but we do want to do that so people don't have to like physically get to one um, it's more like if there's enough it's more like going forward it it has to be 
there, he's working on the mirror project, which is his huge focus project right now that he wants to be working on most of all. And that has to sort of take priority for us. Um, and candles in the dark is something that it's nice when there's a demand and it looks like everything's going to kind of come together for it to happen without it needing to be an extra stress and an extra huge cost. Um, so if that happens, it just, it's looking like going forward, it would that much more need to be something that could come together kind of for us, because if it's going to cost us too much up front and cost us too much extra time, we just can't focus on that yet going forward. So I actually want to incentivize people to get to the one at Anarchapulco this year, because we're going to be busy this coming year. <laughs> so we're going to, we'd love to do another one. It might happen naturally in Arizona because we're here in Arizona and a second one could happen here. Maybe just because we're here and that then we don't have to travel or anything easy. that yeah. makes it easier. Um, but we're not trying to force one for the next, however long it would be, whoever wants to put that together. Or if somebody sees a demand for it, like, Hey, everyone in this city wants it and we'll fund you getting there and whatever. Cool. It could okay. Work. Cool. That makes sense. You know, I'm really, it's interesting hearing you guys. I'm, I'm feeling like before I really listened to you about what uh, Kindles in the Dark was about, I wouldn't consider like myself somebody that would go. I thought maybe it was for attendees and maybe it was just about philosophy. Now that I'm listening to you, I think all, all of us speakers and advocates should go because it sounds like what you're offering would like aid me in what I'm doing, not just in explaining anarchy, but anything I'm doing. So I'm like really, really interested yeah. in, in going and learning more to just gain the skills that you're offering. Definitely. Um, so yeah, and one of the oh, go ahead. Sorry, little glitch in the. One sound. of the difficult things to convey to people is like, there's lots of anarchists out there, and they like, they don't know that this would do any good because they think, well, I already understand it, and I'm good at explaining it, and I'm good at arguing it, and 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 it's hard to convey to them. It doesn't have anything to do with that. Like, yeah. you need to understand it and stuff. But the psychology of how to not set them off is a completely separate thing. It doesn't, right. it doesn't matter how rationally and logically you explain it if somebody immediately goes on the defensive, which is yeah. what happens in almost every discussion. So it really is learning a different skill. And it's almost as silly as like, like you made that whole awesome explanation and none of it mattered because you didn't start with Simon Says. Right. And it's almost that silly that if you don't, adapt to how human psychology works you can have this brilliant explanation of the principles and then after it you'll be like why didn't they understand that and what they freaked out and said but what about my roads and ran out of the room what the heck <laughs> there's a reason they do that and if you understand why they do that you can get it so they don't do that and they actually can hear, hear what you're you. saying so so many anarchists assume that well i don't need that because i understand anarchism this isn't about that I've seen lots and lots of people, myself included, who understood anarchism and did a really bad job of conveying it to anybody else because they didn't understand psychology enough to actually have the other person hear them. And it's really dang imp important. I mean, if the you know two or three thousand, however many anarchists are going to be at Anarchapulco, if they all understood psychology to the degree that they now understood anarchism, that you know it would spread like wildfire. You True. barely, you know, very quickly, we'd need a whole state, not a hotel to do this. <laughs> this is, this is like, this is hugely, hugely important. And I, I was going to ask you, but you answered my question, how could we spread anarchy more? And, and you're exactly giving that answer to understand psychology. Thank you so, so much for explaining that. And I think, I, I hope everybody that's coming watches this uh, video because this is really, really um, powerful stuff. And I, you're the only one offering anything like this. So you're, you're so valued for this reason and I hope, yeah. hope it, I hope it sells out. So can you tell us like what day it's happening and what time and um, where you're having it? The 12th and the 13th, did they all the way decide a time? Normally we do it like 10 a.m. to it's 4 p.m. It's 10 to 4. Okay. 10 cool. to 4 p.m. both days and because it's at Anarchapulco, I cannot speak to what will happen before and after those times. I know that at our other events and at the, at the previous Anarchapulco event we did, um, there was some leeway as in people, there was time to hang around after and still chat with us. And people often use that as an opportunity to like, just come to our ears off for a while and like talk to us, which is cool. cool. You guys don't mind that? You don't mind hanging out, chatting? No, that's, that's well, what we're there for. And when we get awesome. tired of it, we run away. And Anarchapulco <laughs> is like my, so as an introvert, Anarchapulco is like all of the peopling I do condensed into 10 days 
in one year. <laughs> oh my gosh, me too. I totally I know. Yep. After that for the whole <laughs> I hear you. That's exactly, you just put my, my feelings into words too. Like I'm in New Hampshire. Yeah. I'm just like living in the middle of the woods, you know, with my kids. And so it is like my one huge outlet of, of connecting and socializing. And it's like one after the other. So I'm really looking forward to it for the same reason. So what would you guys say, uh, just to end this amazing conversation, what would you guys say you're most looking forward to with Anarchapulco besides, besides what you just shared, Amanda? I would say that that what I'm most looking forward to is the discussions that I don't know are going to happen. Because every time, like, I know the agenda and what talks I'm giving this and that and the other stuff, but some awesome organic conversations with random people I've never met before and didn't know existed happen just over and over and over again. And to me, as awesome as the agenda is and all the speakers and all the events, the, the coolest part is the stuff that just spontaneously happens when you have that many people around you who don't want you enslaved. You mean spontaneous order? <laughs> Imagine that <laughs> without any authority <laughs> commands making it happen. So it, it really is the, the – because, you know, if it was just a lecture, well, you can go watch a video or something, but the, the back and forth and being in that environment and being around the, the people and the conversations and the connections that happen – like the, the best part, I don't know what it's going to be because it's different every time. We, have, that's, we talk that's about cool. that, like how, how Anarchapulco, what, this is what I would say to anybody thinking about, should I go to Anarchapulco? If you are a lover of freedom, the answer is just yes. And I, and I really mean, I don't care what you think about any, like any people who might be going, any speakers, me, any event, any one event, whether or not you agree with any one thing there or not. This is literally your one shot to go and network with more people who don't want you enslaved than anywhere else on the planet all in one place. And those people are forward thinking. So not only do they not want you enslaved, which is kind of a base requirement, I think, for human relationships, <laughs> but they also are trying to think, how can I do something with my life that betters the world? And if you want the highest percentage of those people in one place you will ever find, go to Anarchapulco. That is the value in it because that's really what makes it awesome. We talk about every year how the best thing about it was just being around our people again and the stuff, the conversations we never would have imagined we would have had with so-and-so until this time of night talking about this and this and this. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's anarchist, so it's not the weather. It's, you know, religion and philosophy and the cosmos and health and everything else you can imagine in between. So, yeah. and like as a final plug, I'd say with all the, with all the awesome events and talks and all the different speakers there that are just really cool. If you went there and didn't watch any of the talks or go to any of the scheduled events, it would still be worth it just for the conversations you would accidentally have with people you just happened to bump into. Yep. That's how cool it is. Oh, guys, thank you so much. That was like the best close that ever could be. You know, I've been saying the same thing uh, recently, saying that even if you just went and you were on the property, just being around all like-minded people, I mean, your consciousness would raise. It literally does by being around other people that are, that are like-minded, that have these beliefs. So thank you guys so much. We value your involvement more than you, you could ever know. We love that you guys are coming and we can't wait to see you. I can't believe it's so soon. It's been a whole year. I can't even believe it. Time flies. Yeah. Yeah, it's so still blowing my mind. I'm like, oh my God, it's here. <laughs> I know. And it's going to be so wild this year. Like we're, we're the only ones at the hotel, just all anarchists. That's a first. That's going to be really cool. And I'm looking forward to that. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you want to sign up for Candles in the Dark, go to anarchopoco.com and there's a tab at the top. You can sign up. Tickets are going to go really quick. As you can hear, this is going to be a groundbreaking event. So thank you, Lark, and thank you, Amanda, so much for taking the time to be with us. And we look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks. Peace, love, anarchy. Thanks. Awesome.
is about not wanting to use violence against people and not wanting to steal and extort them. And they try to tell us that the liberty movement is dead. That's a bunch of <laughs> There's alive and well. <laughs> All freedom is our natural and eternal right. And, and shout this message about what real liberty and freedom mean, but for everybody. And I think that we should start a revolution here today. Peace, love, and anarchy.